Tenerife, the largest of the Canary Islands and home to a diverse array of plants and animals. This island was the last holdout of what is now a long and dead forgotten civilization called the Guanche. These people once inhabited all of the Canaries, but one by one, each island fell to the first of the conquistadors until only Tenerife remained. The soon to come Spanish conquest was now inevitable, but the Guanche, they would not go down without a fight. This resistance would eventually culminate into what many call the Guanche genocide. This is the conquest of Tenerife. The first signs of human habitation on Tenerife have been carbon dated back to 500 BCE. The Guanche who settled here were originally from North Africa and belonged to the Berber ethnic group. Around the time that European sailors started exploring the Canaries in the mid 14th century, a Guanche noble boy was born. His name was Tenerife, also known to the Spanish and Guanche alike as Tenerife the Great. Tenerife, after the death of his father, became the Mense of Tenerife, a title similar to that of a king. Tenerife ruled over his island for many years. In that time, he was forced to contend with a new threat that had started emerging on his shores. European raiding parties started attacking the Canary Islands. The bravest, or perhaps dumbest, of these parties even made landfall on the densely populated Tenerife. If these raids did not leave the island swiftly, they would be forced to flee by Mense Tenerife and the entire might of the island. The Europeans grew to fear Tenerife and their great king. Tenerife would continue to rule over his island until his death sometime in the mid-15th century. What followed became a succession crisis on a huge scale between Tenerife's nine sons. None would come out on top, as Tenerife was eventually divided amongst these nine new mense. As we will soon come to see, these divisions would ultimately lead to their downfall. For King Tenerife the Great, his legacy would live on through the Spanish name of the island, which is Tenerife. With their kings now divided, Tenerife became a much easier target for European slavers and raiders. As the rest of the Canary Island chain was conquered all around them, European, mainly Spanish raiding parties, started to grow in frequency on Tenerife. This all came to a head in 1464. In this year, Diego Garcia de Herrera, husband and consort to his majesty, Queen Inez Peraza of the Canary Islands, comes to an agreement with one of the Mense sons of Tenerife. The son in question is named Benjaro. He came to rule in the northern tip of the island. The agreement that he made with Diego Garcia de Herrera was one of trade. Mense Benjaro allowed for the construction of a trading outpost on his shores. This would give his tribe, called the Anaga, an advantage over his rival brothers, as he now held a monopoly over the European goods on the island that most importantly included iron weapons and early firearms. On top of introducing the Guanche to these new weapons, the prolonged contact with European traders also brought a new and far deadlier killer of the Guanche, disease. For this reason, and I'm sure many others, in 1472, Mense Benharo and his Inaga warriors forced the Europeans back onto their boats, destroying the small outpost where they had traded from. The trading post had only lasted for eight years, however its impact would be felt far into the future. The introduction of diseases like smallpox and influenza would run amok through all the Guanche communities. They had no immunities, leaving them susceptible to infection, and more common than not, dead. For now, the European threat had been expelled from the island, but it still lingered all around Tenerife. In 1490, the Mense of the Obona tribe would be the next to come to an agreement with the Spanish. His name was Adonja, and after a meeting with the governor of the recently conquered Gran Canaria, a treaty of peace was established between the two. The nine brothers had been at each other's throats, but now Adonja was the first to accept what was soon to become the Spanish domination of Tenerife. This was a wise move for him that would soon be followed up by two other of his brothers. First was Mense Antaterve of the Guaymar tribe, who came to a similar agreement with the Spanish in that same year. Then in 1492, the governor of Gran Canaria would return, this time meeting with Mense Benajaro. Giving the Spanish another chance, he comes to a peace deal with the governor. Like the previous one, this too was not to last. 
Shortly after the 1492 agreement, one of the many Spanish slave raids arrived on Inaga shores. This was a clear break to the recently ratified treaty and resulted in Benharo breaking off Spanish relations once again. By 1493, only two of the main seven Canary Islands remained still in the hands of the Guanche, those being Tenerife and La Palma. However, later in 1493, the island of La Palma would be conquered by a Spanish naval officer in under a year. The conquistador in question was a man named Alonso Fernandez de Lugo. After participating in the conquest of Gran Canaria, de Lugo was handed the responsibility of conquering La Palma. The Spanish monarchs, Ferdinand and Isabella, challenged de Lugo's abilities, tasking him with conquering La Palma in under a year from its first landing. With use of subterfuge, he achieved this and was granted a reward of 700,000 gold pieces from the two monarchs. De Lugo was left satisfied, but not for long. By December of 1493, after some convincing, De Lugo is given the rights to conquer the last Canary Island. In exchange for this, Ferdinand and Isabella asked De Lugo to return his bonus, as the conquest of Tenerife, if successful, would earn De Lugo his own fortune. With his sponsorship, the conquistador left Spain and made sail for Grand Canaria at the head of 2,000 foot soldiers accompanied by another 200 mounted Spanish knights. After resupplying on Gran Canaria, Alonso Fernandez de Lugo began his journey towards Tenerife. In late April, he would arrive on the shores of the final Guanche Island. The conquest of Tenerife has now began. De Lugo would land on Anaga shores. With his army in sight, the Mense, Benaharo, for the third and final time, announces his peace towards Spain. De Lugo then builds a fort close to his landing location. Eventually, this small fort would grow into the city of Santa Cruz, the modern-day capital of Tenerife. With Mense Benaharo's early submission, De Lugo looked to the other eight Mense to see if they would do the same. The Guaymar under Mense Anaturve and the Abona under Mense Ajonia would both accept De Lugo as part of their 1490 peace treaty. The Adeje tribe in the south of the island became split on the situation some choosing to resist, but others, such as their mense, Adabita Kasbi, chose peace and surrendered. With the south and east of Tenerife now secured by their local allies, De Lugo looked to come to a similar deal with the rest of the island. After all, a conquest without bloodshed would be favorable for everybody. Mense Bencomo of Lataro was having none of it. This island belonged to him and his brothers by right of inheritance not men who sailed from far away to take their goods and people away. Alonso Fernandez de Lugo marched further inland until finally meeting with the Taro Mense. Ben Como and a great host of Guanche warriors met de Lugo in his own company. De Lugo offered peace as he had to the southern Mense. Ben Como rejected, turning away from the negotiations. War was now inevitable. Mense Ben Como returned to his Taro lands. On the way, inspiring, and informing his brother kings of De Lugo's intentions. In all, the other four remaining Mense, all on the northern coast, put their differences aside and aligned themselves under Ben Como's leadership. Ben Como started assembling an army. In all, he had gathered around 3,300 fighting men, armed with long wooden spears and rocks for throwing. Among these warriors was a great, hulking man named Tinguaro. He was another one of the brothers of Ben Como but remained loyal to Bencomo after the death of their father. Tinguaro was given command of 300 of the warriors, while Bencomo would command the main force of 3,000. For De Lugo, he continued his march along the northern, rebellious coast of Tenerife, his army now looting villages along with their Guanche allies that had joined his force. In all, De Lugo's force numbered around 1,120, as he kept about 1,000 of his infantry garrisoned in the recently constructed fort. Mountains on both sides of him, on May 31st of 1494, De Lugo led his men into an unsuspecting ravine. Entering into this ravine, De Lugo looked around at the heavily wooded hillsides that were filled with shrubs. The quiet sanctity of this ravine, called Asantejo by the Spanish, would be shattered by a hail of stones and the appearance of a massive guanche warrior. 
dressed in only a goat skin and running with a spear in hand. De Lugo had walked into a trap. Now the 300 men, under the leadership of Tinguaro, assaulted the trapped Spanish. Tinguaro was fighting with his men. His size and swiftness made him a great and formidable warrior. When Tinguaro's force broke the silence, Mense Bencamo completed the encirclement, attacking the rear of De Lugo's force and trapping the Spanish in Asentejo Ravine. The might of the conquistador's guns and horses that were supposed to give them the advantage only weighed them down. The guanche bared down on them from all sides. The horses became tangled in the thick foliage, leaving the 200 knights to dismount. The perfectly timed ambush, combined with the close quarter combat, gave the guanche warriors the advantage. The outnumbered and surrounded De Lugo fought with his men through the chaos that he had led them into. His army was all being cut down around him. His situation was helpless. All he could do now was attempt an escape. Giving his red cape that signified his rank to an unfortunate common soldier, he then, with his bodyguard in tow, tries to cut his way out of the ravine, going up one of the hillsides. As his men fight through the guanche, a stone finds the jaw of De Lugo. After being dazed and likely concussed, De Lugo regained his footing, spitting teeth from his now bleeding mouth. Eventually, De Lugo and his personal guard do manage to fight their way out of the Asentejo ravine. For what was his army, 1,000 had fell, with only 120 managing to escape the slaughter. For De Lugo, he had lost his first battle and the majority of his teeth. He retreated back to his fort that he had only built a month before. From there, he abandons Tenerife, returning in defeat back to Gran Canaria. For Bencamo and Tinguaro, the brothers had just dealt the conquistadors their worst defeat in the Canaries. Not only was it the conquistador's worst defeat in the Canary Islands, but it was also the worst defeat any Atlantic conquistador would suffer. Not even the massive Aztec and Incan empires could hand Spain such a defeat. The humiliated Alonso Fernandez de Lugo returned to Gran Canaria at the beginning of June, his force roughly half of what it had been when he left. De Lugo may have been defeated, but in his recovery, he still refused to give up. He started looking for investors to fund his new conquest and found them in a few merchants on Gran Canaria. On top of this, De Lugo sold most of what he owned. His reputation was on the line here. The investor to contribute the most to De Lugo was Queen Inez Peraza. The Lady of Lanzarote and Forviventura gave 600,000 gold pieces to the Spanish captain. In exchange for this, and so De Lugo would keep his end of the deal, Inez Peraza took his two children as hostages until she was repaid, interest included. Now with the proper funds, De Lugo looked to recruit. Some of his men, fearing Tenerife, his force was only 200 now. Inez Peraza gave him another 200 infantry. De Lugo sent letters back to Spain, asking for assistance and promising wealth for anyone fit to join him. A few months later, the Duke of Seville showed up with 670 infantry and 80 cavalry. Still waiting, another 500 infantry from Spain arrived on Gran Canaria, intent on joining De Lugo. Now his recovered force numbered around 1,650 soldiers, smaller than his failed force of 2,000, but far better trained. The men who had arrived from Spain were mostly veterans of the 1492 conquest of Granada. In late October of 1494, now with more experienced men, De Lugo raised sail and started the journey towards Tenerife. He would land at the same place he had in April of that year, near what is now the city of Santa Cruz. Retracing his steps, he comes across the ruined fort that he had built in April. In his absence, the Guanche had utterly destroyed it. So he spent his first week on Tenerife rebuilding and preparing. After rebuilding his Santa Cruz stronghold, De Lugo leaves around 400 men and 10 of his mounted knights as a permanent garrison much smaller than the 1,000 he had left behind in May. De Lugo now set off, accompanied by 600 allied Guanche, on November 12th of 1494. Mense Bencamo had learned about the arrival of his enemy shortly after the conquistadors had landed. He was probably not expecting De Lugo to recover so quickly. Despite this, he was still prepared. His spies were everywhere, waiting for the return of the Spanish. In fact, these spies 
and the advantage of the home field is what enabled for the massive Guanche ambush at the Asantejo Ravine. As De Lugo began his march, he caught two of these spies, taking away one of Ben Camo's greatest advantages. After gathering a force of 5,000 Guanche from the five Mente still on his side, Ben Como began a march to meet De Lugo again. The two armies were now on a collision course. After two days of march, on November 14th, the advance guard of De Lugo discovered Ben Como's army. They had made camp in the Valley of Aguare. Now De Lugo held the advantage of the element of surprise. On both sides of the Aguare Valley, there were three mountains, one called San Roque, the other named La Laguna, and the final, and tallest, named La Siusta. On the night of November 14th, assisted by his Guanche allies and the darkness, De Lugo and his force scaled the tallest peak of La Siusta. Ben Como, not expecting to encounter the Spanish this soon, had posted no men to guard the mountains. When dawn broke, Ben Como realized his mistake. His enemy now held the high ground, and all he had was a flat valley that gave him no advantage. Despite this, Ben Como did not flinch, organizing his army under the early morning light. He would control the center and bulk of the army with 3,000 men under his command, giving his left flank and another 1,000 men to his loyal brother, Tinguaro. His right flank was under the generalship of another one of his brothers, the mensei of neighboring Takoronte, named Akiyama. Now organized, Bencamo ordered an advance on the combined Spanish and Guanche force. The Spanish had taken a defensive stance, pikemen in the front, with crossbowmen, gunmen, and artillery behind them. On either flank, the 600 Guanche allies positioned themselves ready to engage their fellow islanders. De Lugo positioned himself behind his skirmishers, along with his 70 mounted knights. The battle began with the Guanche launching a full frontal assault. Before they could reach the Spanish lines, they were cut down by lead, crossbow bolts, and cannonballs. Despite this, they pushed on, only finding a line of pikes that had far more reach than their own wooden spears. For many hours, the Guanche fought on, but ultimately, they failed to break the line of pikemen. Mensei Akiyamo, Tinguaro, and Mensei Benkamo eventually all became wounded, but still, they fought on. After losing hundreds of his warriors, Benkamo orders a retreat. At the very same time, De Lugo ordered his 70 knights forward to hunt down the disorganized Guanche. The slaughter had now began. The three Guanche commanders split up, Akiyamo running down the valley and making a successful retreat. Tinguaro attempted retreating up the nearby mountain of San Roque, his men all falling around him until he was the last man standing of his company. Wounded and weary, Tinguaro fought on, even as many as seven knights surrounded him. Tinguaro was only delaying the inevitable. At the top of San Roque, there waited a lone pikeman. When Tinguaro realized this, he exclaimed to the man that he was the son of Tenerife and Prince of the Guanche. The pikeman did not care, running his weapon through the warrior and killing him at the peak of San Roque. One of the greatest warriors on Tenerife had fallen, but the slaughter was not over. Ben Como, still with some of his men around him, fought his way up La Laguna Mountain, all the while his force was being harassed by the Spanish knights. When the terrain became too steep for the horses, De Lugo sent in his swordsmen to dislodge the Mense from his mountain. After a valiant defense, Ben Como and his remaining men fall victim to the conquistadors. For the Guanche, they had lost around 2,000 of their warriors and the face of their resistance. The Spanish continued pursuing a retreating Guanche, pushing their advantage. De Lugo's force had only lost around 50 men. With the Battle of Asantejo now revenged, De Lugo marched in the direction of his defeat, his jaw likely twitching as he approached the ravine. After their defeat and subsequent retreat, the remaining Guanche continued fighting a guerrilla war, not giving an inch to De Lugo without him first paying for it in blood. With their Mense now dead, Bencomo's grandson, named Bentor, became the new Mense of the Taro. He organized a new army and prepared to avenge his grandfather and uncle. De Lugo sent forward a letter to the new Mense, offering peace if he surrendered and converted to Christianity. 
Just like his grandfather, Bentor refused, continuing his resistance. After a month of recovery, Bentor was ready to face De Lugo. His force now exceeded more than 6,000. They marched towards the site of their great victory at Asantejo. On Christmas Day of 1494, the two forces met near Asantejo. The Spanish force, after a month of guerrilla warfare, numbered around 700. The men that were killed were replaced by their local Guanche allies, who now comprise a majority of the force, numbering 800 warriors. De Lugo split his force into two along these lines, while Bentor charged at the head of 6,000 warriors. After three hours of a grueling battle, the Spanish and their allies came out on top. Bentor and his remaining force retreated up a nearby mountain to Gaiga. Although in a very defensible position, were also trapped and running out of food fast. As 1494 gave way to 1495, their situation became untenable. In February of that year, Bentor had made his final decision. Instead of hopelessly defending his mountaintop as his uncle and grandfather had, he instead flung himself over the cliff, committing suicide. Now, the Guanche were truly lost. Most surrendered, accepting the conditions of their conquerors and converting to Christianity. By July 25th of 1495, De Lugo had accepted the submission of all of the remaining Mense, with the exception of Ataro Mense, as Bentor was the final of his tribe's rulers. The only resistance on Tenerife remained in the south, under the leadership of a self-proclaimed Adige Mense named Ikachaska. He would continue a guerrilla war for another 30 years, until his death in 1525 at the hands of the Spanish. By 1496, the conquest of Tenerife was all but complete, when Alonso Fernandez de Lugo took the eight Mense back to Spain. Here, one by one, each Mense surrendered directly to King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella. With this done, de Lugo returned them to Tenerife and started governing the island under the crown of Spain. Colonizers from Spain and other parts of Europe began settling on the island in droves. Many chose peaceful integration with the Guanche, but very often, the mistreatment of the natives became common practice. Even the slave runs that had plagued them for decades still continued. Better than anyone else, the integration of these two peoples is best represented by Princess de Sil, daughter of Mense Bencamo. Shortly after the conquest concluded, she married a Spanish captain and converted to Christianity. Disease, as it had since the arrival of the Europeans, still continued to kill hundreds of Guanche yearly. This, combined with their enslavement and integration with their colonizers, eventually led to the extinction of the Guanche people. Outside of a few DNA scraps, I'm talking maximum 5%, there are no Guanche left today. This may have not been what the Spanish intended, but the poor mistreatment of the Guanche did lead to their gradual genocide. The conquest of Tenerife was the last paragraph in the first chapter of the Spanish conquistadors. The Guanche represented the first of many Stone Age civilizations that the Spanish would come to conquer over the next century in the New World. The Canary Islands as a whole acted as their training ground. The conquest of Tenerife is very similar to the conquest of the Aztecs and Inca. The Spanish on Tenerife, like in the New World, used local allies to divide the Guanche, while disease infected their populations. Then, with their superior technology, they defeated the islanders in battle. A genocide, even if successful like this one, is only complete if the memory of those who died are forgotten. With that in mind, I ask you to keep the memory of the Guanche active in your mind.